for the Local History and Genealogy section of Mobile Public Library. Today I am just delighted to be here with one of Mobile's foremost, I guess, lecturer, writer, traveler, actor, painter, you name it almost, and this would be Eugene Ferdinand Walter. Eugene, it's so nice to be here with you today. What were all those other names you were telling me besides Eugene Ferdinand? There was some... My full name is Eugene Ferdinand Francis Willoughby Walter. Oh. But I use Eugene Ferdinand. Good. Um, you see, there's a, another man in Mobile who's named Eugene F. Walters with an S. And I've been at the Library of Congress. I've been confused ever since my first book came out. I did all the proper things for copyright and paid the fee and filled out the forms, but the Library of Congress put my first publication and all my subsequent publications under the name of the playwright Eugene Walter, a distant cousin who was born in 1879 and died in 1941. So I'm really the only American writer who has published 15 books from the grave. <laughs> well, if this is going to be the kind of interview we're going to have. Yeah, only, <laughs> only in the last year has that been corrected at the Library of Congress. A Turkish girl who was a docent at the Library of Congress was checking all the entries in the W's. And she called me and said, there's something odd. And can you explain? And I said, oh, yes, I can explain. And I have written the Library of Congress. And they've never done anything. But she did get it straightened out. Well, you have <coughs> your own books there. So they would have <coughs> a number of books under this name. But one one was you and one wasn't. <laughs> well, he died in 1941. My first book was published in 1946. Oh, my goodness. Well, now, Eugene, I know that you were doing writing and uh, artwork and all that sort of thing long before 1946, because I was down at the press register then and remember you coming in. I believe you said you start, had your first art exhibit. What date was that? Oh, 1936, I think, or 34, I can't forget. I was 13 years old. It was 1930-something, and uh, it was at the Mobile Public Library. But you see, I'd worked with children's theater and also designing Mardi Gras floats and costumes. Uh, at, at that age? Or? Oh, yes. Yes. Well, what in your background, I know you're a native Mobilian, what in your background gave you such talents at such an early age or such uh, abilities and the, uh, desire to... Part to of it was that I was free. I had a French-Swiss grandmother, a Bavarian grandfather, a Norwegian grandfather who died before I was born, and uh, my mother, her mother was a f old, old Gulf Coast family that was part French and part English. And somehow, nobody ever said to me, it's time to go to bed or time to do your homework, or they just, as long as I was quiet, I could stay up all night writing and drawing pictures as long as I didn't bother anybody. And no one told you you were too young to write or too no, young to paint. <laughs> no. And uh, I hated school from the beginning, and uh, I had an interesting education. I was uh, my grandmother used to always bake pies and cakes for the Jesuits who had a Greek and Latin grammar school down on uh, Contact Street where my father and my uncle went. But when she saw these new Jesuits who were from New England, uh, they were potato famine Jesuits, which is a, another race of Jesuits. And she saw them inking in fig leaves on pictures of classical statuary in the Greek and Latin textbooks. So she said, little Eugene is not going to study with them. So I went every morning to St. Joseph's Church with her to, before the first mass and carried water and took out yesterday's dead flowers and she arranged the flowers on the altar. Then I went to public school. But being of an old Catholic family, I went then to catechism with some Polish nuns whom I loved. They still wore wool uniforms all year and they smelled just like wet collie dogs. <laughs> and uh, since I liked dogs, I was happy with them. But I wouldn't learn the catechism because it was printed on cheap paper, just like the comic books. And I knew that the life of Christ had to be on good paper. I was born a book snob. It was not taught me. I was born a book snob. 
I wanted good paper, good bindings, and good illustrations. So uh, Sister, Sister Mary Stanislaus would beat me over the hands with a ruler that said on one side, drink Coca-Cola, and on the other side it said, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. The golden rule, they used to so, pass them out. So uh, I came of age spiritually very young. Mm. <laughs> now you were actually, you were born when? Do you mind telling? Not at all. I was born in 19, the end of 1921, the last day of November 1921. Mm. Okay. And then already by age 13 you were having this interesting education. Well, I mean, I had, I was never, I was never held down. I was never tied up. I was never threatened. Uh, they just would say, you want to, you want to draw all night? Draw all night. Uh, you want to write? Write. The point is that I had heard such wonderful music. Um, where I was born at the corner of Contine Bio, and only a block or so away was the uh, wonderful Bio Street Church, the Black Church. And I was allowed to slip into the back of that and hear this fabulous chorus. They were heaven. At the same time, my uncle had made the first radio that was in Mobile. He put together the first radio and we heard Mozart string quartets, very squeaky on that. Somehow I got into this world of music early on and from that naturally poetry. And actually I was trying to write, I made up rhymes before I could read and write. It was just one of those things, a combination of circumstances. Uh, and the right kind of mind. Eugene. Well, I'm going to give you credit. Well, possibly. But I think so many people are squashed by uh, forced education or lack of education. Right. I just was absolutely fortunate in just in all things, just fortunate. Right. You had access to the Mobile Library, I'm sure, and used that? And well, that was before the library when I started. There were the see. two sisters who had a house on Contact Street that was groaning with books. That was the ancestor. Mm -hmm. It was just their private library. They let, pe let books to people. And finally, they, you see, Boston had a public library in 1690-something. Mobile didn't have a public library until 1923. But that's just because of the difference in the organization of life. I mean, yes. uh, you know, yes. Mobile was a, a port but people had private libraries. I remember once when some snotty Yankee publication was talking about how there were no bookshops in Mobile and no libraries. But I knew dozens of houses that were full of books. And when I was a small child, I was given for a Christmas present a credit at E. Heffer and Sons, the wonderful old bookshop in Cambridge, England. Because mm. of, of course, uh, there were no bookshops in Mobile. The, the prohibition killed uh, killed all the restaurants in downtown Mobile and much of culture because the minute the restaurants in downtown Mobile were gone, then the theaters died, the bars died, the bookshops died, the publishers died. But I mean, the South once had an extraordinary publishing history. I mean, uh, the Gossip Publishing Company down on Dolphin Street had somebody meeting the packet boat from Liverpool because the weekly installments of Dickens or Thackeray were met by a rider, packet rider, who went from London halfway to Liverpool, met another fast horseman and got that weekly installment on the packet ship from Liverpool to Mobile. Oh my, and what, what kind of date is this now? The middle of the 1800s. 1800s. So some of Thackeray and Dickens were first published in Mobile because mm. the weekly parts were published yes. here immediately. Anyway, I always am irritated when some of those Yankee types, you know, start talking about uh, no bookshops and no libraries in the South. They just were recent developments. I mean, just the, our history is different from right. the Northern history. Right. 